Good morning. I have a little story to tell you this morning, and later on in the program, you can perhaps call me and tell me what you think of my attitude. It all began Sunday morning. I was having breakfast, and I was reading The Sunday Province. A story by Canadian Press, that eminently august and responsible organ owned by the newspapers, which distributes information across the country by telex. There is a new tactic, it says. Exasperated women's groups all across Canada are now saying that their new tactic of rape confrontation is its last resort in a battle to eliminate the anonymity enjoyed by rapists. This rape confrontation was first used by a BC feminist group, Rape Relief. About 15 women, it says here, appear at the homes of men they know to have committed rape, but who were not charged or convicted. And when the man answers the door, they chant, we know what you did, we know who you are, we're watching you, right? Usually, says a spokesman of rape relief in Vancouver, when they do this in Vancouver, the men are extremely mortified, but it's not always an appropriate tactic. The main purpose of this incredible uh, ploy is to expose rapists who often go unpunished because of a victim's reluctance to press charges. There have been three or four confrontations reported in Vancouver, but none of the men involved complained to the police. What do we have here? We have a group of activist women who are acting as judge, jury, and executioner in cases where the police have neither charged nor convicted, and in cases where these rape relief people may have the wrong man. If any other group in the country did this, the civil libertarians would be out screaming, ranting, and raving. Not a single comment has appeared anywhere prior to what I'm telling you now. Now, am I coming to you unprepared? Not in the slightest. We have been in touch with Rape Relief and their answering service on four occasions. And we have been informed, as we gave them full opportunity to come on this program, deny it, confirm it, or tell us specifically what they're doing, that they do not wish to send anyone to the Webster Show to talk about this aspect of rape relief. I don't go off half-cocked on these things. This rape relief is an institution which is amply supported by public funds. Currently, they get $61,000 of public money, $6,200 from the city of Vancouver, and the balance of uh, the 61000 comes the Social Credit Government will be pleased to learn from the Department of the Attorney General, the Department of Human Resources, and the Department of Health. Public funds apparently being used for this totally improper, illegal, unfair, unjust attack on men whom these women think are unconvicted rapists. I find the whole thing abominable, disgusting in the nth degree. And I would seriously suggest that rape relief had better come out from behind their little consensus committees and explain themselves in full. And if they don't, I would suggest, I presume they've done some useful work of some kind, you can't tell it by me, that the Vancouver City Council Marzari and company, that the Attorney General's Department, Human Resources and the Health Department of the Provincial Government take a very hard look at an organization which appears to be running its own system of justice in British Columbia. Where are you, Rape Relief? Why are you hiding from answering this very serious charge made against you in the public prints? Come on tomorrow morning, any time you like. Tell us if it's true or false. But don't, in any case, let it happen again. Enough of that. You can tell me what you think about that later on. 
On the second part, the next part of this morning's program, we're going to meet a new union mogul, M-O-G-U-L. His name is Bill Jackson. He is the president of the National Union of Provincial Government Employees, which is almost a coast-to-coast -coast organization. Who knows what their plans are for national illegal or wildcat or legal or proper strikes of almost every provincial government employee in the whole country of Canada. Bill Jackson after the break. Bill Jackson is president of NUPGI. Couldn't you change the acronym and make the thing usable? NUPGI? What is NUPGI? Well, it's the National Union of Provincial Employees, Jack, as you said, almost from coast to coast. And if you can find a better name for me, please give it to me. National Union of Provincial Government Employees. That's right. If you drop the G, you could make it NOOP. Well, we could do that. That'd be a better acronym. What are your plans to organize union? You're not a union, are you? We're a union, but I would think it would be fair to say at this point in time we're a federation of unions. And what are your plans to close down the provincial government operations across the country? No plans to close down provincial operations across the country at this time. Are you telling me there's no solidarity in your executive that you must use all the clout of every organized employee and when injustices appear, close down all eight provinces? I think I'd be dreaming if I told you that I could do that. I can't. I don't have that kind of power, Jack. Is that, not what they, is that not what the militants and the activists would like to see? Provincial government employees across the country properly organized with due solidarity so that you can bring everybody up to the same incredibly high level of wages and working conditions achieved in British Columbia. Well, I would say that in British Columbia, the British Columbia Government Employees Union have done a good job. I hope I can do as good a job across Canada as they've done here. You're not going to let me rattle you at all as far? Oh, I'll let you rattle me. Go ahead. You're not, you, you are, as the Financial Post says, Arbane. I don't even know what that means. Oh, come off it. How many college degrees do you have? None at all. You mean a boy, barefoot boy, who made it to the top of the union movement at only 33? I'm a farm boy from Manitoba. Don't look like a farm boy to me. Um, next point. You can never be really national. Uh, let's put it this way. Why have the Quebec provincial government employees not joined your federation of provincial government people? Well, you'll find in Quebec that uh, the majority of organized workers do not join national bodies. They join Quebec-based bodies, and that's almost without exception. Uh, we have not made any attempt up to this point in time to get a membership in Quebec. That's something that we'll do in the years ahead. And we're not ready to do that yet, frankly. We've got a lot of other things we have to do before we start trying to increase our, our base by going into that province. But that particular rot prevents you from going coast to coast. That's right. And will always so do. Well, it depends. Uh, uh, some of our members would say uh, once Quebec leaves Canada, if they do, then we are coast to coast. However, our union and our members really do not want to see Quebec leave Canada. We want to see the provincial employees in that province part of our federation, part of our union. But now is not the time to invite them in. If some of your members feel that, how many of the some? Uh, do you have a significant factor of provincial government employees who would like Quebec to leave Canada? I would imagine that if you took an, an opinion poll in Canada and found that a percentage of Canadians wanted Quebec to leave, that my union members would reflect the findings of that poll. Mm -hmm. What's the other place you're not organized? I'm uh, not affiliated with. We do not have members at this time in the province of New Brunswick. However, most provincial employees in that province are represented by one of our sister unions, the Canadian Union of Public Employees. There may come a day, however, when we will have members in that province. But again, that's not going to be in 1980. Yeah, but you must have a tactic in the back of your mind. What's the purpose of this? Not merely to meet and have expensive conventions in the good climate in Vancouver in the spring, is it? Well, I'm afraid there are some people in our union who think that's what we should be doing. However, I think we should be doing far more than that. And we're going to have a convention here in Vancouver, and the convention here is going to determine whether we're a social butterfly club or indeed our union. And there are a number of resolutions that will go before that convention. And when they're passed, we will become a union. Now, what's your intention? Now, are you just the, the interim president? What happened to your previous president? A fellow by the name of uh, Broad, I think That's it was. That's right. What the, happened to him? The previous president uh, decided, uh, I believe, uh, that he would take the autonomy of the provincial organizations and set up a central body in Ottawa to run all the provincial unions across the country. That is something I opposed, and all members of his board opposed that. It became apparent to him that he had no support in his board. 
and he resigned. And I might tell you he resigned on several occasions, but he resigned one time too many, Jack, and they accepted the resignation. And you gave him rather a generous financial settlement. Uh, he received a generous financial settlement, yes. He received approximately one half year's salary at the time of his departure. Which would be about 25000 Yes, 25000 So you have a 50000 a year job yourself. No, because his settlement uh, included his traveling expenses. My salary, if, you, if you're going to ask yes, that, yes. I'll tell you what it is. Yes, it's yes. $43,000. Hardly overpaid. How many members do you have? Two, well, just under 200000 Does this make this makes you the biggest? Oh, apart from the federal government. Well, apart from QP, it makes us the biggest union in the country. We are larger than the Federal uh, Public Service Alliance of Canada. QP, one of your favorite unions? Oh, we have our disagreements with QP, but we're going to try to iron those out. In fact, I had uh, dinner last week with Grace Hartman, the president of QP, and uh, we touched on a number of the contentious issues between us. Very seriously now. How much, oh, I'll take it after the break. What I want to know from you, I mean, I regard the B.C. government employees union contract here as a first-class contract. There's no doubt about that, with magnificent working conditions. I want you to be specific on disparities across the country after the break. If you are elected as president, re-elected as president, give me, from your point of view, we've got thousands of civil servants on the four-day week here who'll sit at home watching Webster, <laughs> or flex time, or whatever. What, is your, what are your aims for the usefulness, from a union point of view, of this organization? Merely propaganda? No, the provincial employees, being a large part of the makeup of the Canadian Labour Congress, uh, have not been really a major part in affecting any of the decisions of the Congress. That's one of my main aims, to see to it that the, the views of the public sector employees carry much greater weight in the, in the councils of the Congress, because we certainly don't carry enough weight now. That probably is my immediate goal for 1980-81. That would be the priority. To get your opinions into the council? Yes. And of, you, of course, you're a full-time backer and supporter of the brilliant Mr. McDermott. Well, I'll be judging Mr. McDermott on his total record. Uh, he has done some things that I agree Seems with. Seems to me he has split the Congress or some of the membership into two. Yes. With his rather extravagant right-wing social democratic views. Well, he has taken a high profile on his support of the New Democratic Party, and that has not pleased all of the rank-and-file members of the CLC. Uh, certainly that's evidenced by the, uh, by the percentage of the vote that that party got in the last election. You yourself, of course, are a member of the NDP. I am not a member of the NDP. Why not? Well, I was told at one time that it was a prerequisite that I had to be, but I found that I can climb up the ladder in the labor movement without being a member of any party. Now, let me tell you that it's my personal belief, supported, I believe, by my membership, that provincial employees in their union at least, should not be supporting any political party because, let's face it, each of those parties at some point in time are going to become the boss. You sound like Samuel Gompers to me, and for the benefit of those of recent generations, Gompers was the old AFL man who said, reward your friends and punish your enemies, but don't be tied to anyone. Yes, I've been told that, uh, but I'll also say this. I think uh, candidate per candidate across the country if we supported candidates rather than parties, you'd find that we'd be supporting more new Democrats than we would liberals or conservatives. See, I asked the question, though. Are you a member of any political party? I'm so not. You're not. This is a deliberate policy in your point of view. Well, it's no, it's a deliberate policy, yes, but it's frustration myself. I found that years ago that politicians, once they get elected, really have one goal, and that is to get re-elected, and they can certainly change their principles in order to do that. And that goes for any party, in, in my opinion and in my experience. Mm-hmm. Strikes in the civil service are one of the most irritating things from the point of view of the general public. Agreed? Yes, they can be irritating. Across the country, how many of your people do not have the right to strike? They do not have the right to strike in the provinces of Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Ontario, Alberta, and there is doubt with the present legislation in the province of Manitoba. But they have the right to strike, broadly speaking, in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, uh, amongst my members, you could add Newfoundland to that, Newfoundland. To Newfoundland, British yeah. Columbia, and Saskatchewan. Do you think there is ever any justification for a general strike of, of civil servants? Oh, there can be justification. However, I've subscribed to a view that it, it is not necessary to have a general strike. You can pick target areas, and you strike in those target areas. There's no need to inconvenience the entire population of any province when you have a dispute. Aren't there some areas, though, where there should never be strikes? Fire. Yes, yes. Uh, there are certain essential occupations. Name them. 
I don't want to name them. Why I'm not? going to leave that to people like uh, who head the provincial unions because in each province you have a difference. Now, in the province of British Columbia, I believe the BCGEU can, can sit down and perhaps have sat down and negotiated some of the essential areas with the government. Whereas in other provinces, governments have simply unilaterally declared the entire public service is essential. You're aware of the Weiler ruling in B.C., aren't you? I Paul have a familiarity Weiler. with it, yes. That was a very astute ruling, even though he was, generally speaking, remarkably pro-union. Oh, no, he's appointed by the NDP. Of course he was pro-union. But what he did was he immediately said, certainly you may go on strike, some of you, but such and such a nominated person will cross his own union's picket line and supply the essential services. This was in the famous hospital strike in the General Hospital. And that really, I suppose, serves both purposes, essential services for the public, and it makes the union members who are not suffering, or are not working, suffer from lack of money. That's my, a good technique, isn't it? It's a technique, Jack. Uh, my personal view on that is, is that the concept of essentiality is something that should be decided at the negotiating table. That's the place where it should be cited, not by any third-party tribunals and not unilaterally by the employer who happens to be the government. And you, would you agree with me that we're not operating in the 1930s and that the worker, generally speaking, is no longer crunched under the jackboot of the capitalist boss? Thanks to the union movement, uh, to a degree you're right. However, I can see that, that happening again. You might have smiled when I gave you that old party line, <laughs> wouldn't you? But not a, well, not you see, a glimmer I of a smile. I wasn't you here in the 30s. You are our bane. I wasn't here in the 30s. You must have read about them. Oh, yes, I've read about them. And you come from Manitoba. Yes, and we've had some there, yes. Yeah, well, you had an essential strike in 1919. Yes, and my father can tell me about that. He was there. He was only about four years old, but he tells me he can remember it. But, I mean, you, you don't cover police. No, you don't. Do you? We don't cover police. We cover correctional officers and, and, Prison and uh, guards. quasi police people. We have many people uh, in our membership who have peace officer status, but not policemen as such. Well, we're all right as far as prison guards are concerned, as long as we've got the quasi military body of the RCMP who can always step in and look after prisons if few people do strike there. Is that not correct? That's, our, that's the public's guarantee of security in that area. The public's real guarantee of security is the union recognizing that there are some essential services, even in a correctional institution. In 1978, I led a correction strike in the province of Manitoba. Don't tell me you're a social worker. No, I'm not. I'm not. Well, I, I was president of the Manitoba Government Employees Association then. Tell me about your strike. My career is a public health inspector, ah, so I'm not a social worker. Good. So we led that strike in 1978, and I spoke to the Minister of Corrections at that time and guaranteed him that my members, who were on picket duty around the jails, would be available at any time he needed an essential service performed, but I wanted him to discuss essentiality with me before that took place. We had that agreement. Fortunately, the strike ended a week later to the satisfaction of both parties in the dispute. Mm -hmm. But we would have put enough people into the jails in order to guarantee the protection of the public of the province of Manitoba. But that had to be something that was agreed to mutually by the government and by the union, not unilaterally imposed by either side. Had the government tried to impose it, they would have found nobody would have been willing to go in and do the work. They can always get court orders. Court orders, yes. And I suppose court orders can be defied. And I don't like to talk about defying them, but they can be defied. Seldom seen them defied in this country. Seldom, but it has happened. Recently in the province of Ontario, where the president of our largest union there uh, defied a court order, and he spent 28 days in jail as a result of it. Maybe he deserved it. In fact, he did if he defied the court order, didn't he? That's a long story. I would say that he didn't deserve it because he defied a law that was made by an ass. And it, when laws are made by asses, they're made to be broken. The truly, truly loyal subject of the chief magistrate neither submits to nor consents to arbitrary decrees. Is that right? That's right. Junius, I have a PhD from a secondary school in Glasgow. Really? No, no, no. But as I've said many a time, the annoyance of some Canadians Three years in the old days in the secondary school in Glasgow is equivalent to a Canadian PhD. I've been to Glasgow many times and you're probably right. A fine background to come from. We didn't talk about disparities. Yes. Let's uh, see what some provincial government employees or others think about this new big union. 200,000 pampered darlings of the provincial governments across the country. Hey. Well, pampered darlings? Yeah. I don't know. I don't agree with Jack. After the break. <laughs>
little story before your time. Um, I gave Dave Barrett his very first interview of his career, I think it was, <laughs> when he was fired by an attorney general of the day because as a corrections officer or something in a corrections system, couldn't have been a corrections officer. No, he was a social worker uh, for running for politics. In how many provinces are your people free to run for political office from a government job without interference by the system? Complete freedom, believe it or not, in only one province, that being British Columbia. In the other province, it varies. Uh, there are some provinces where, in order to run, you will automatically lose your job. You'll either resign or you'll be fired. Mm -hmm. Certainly, in most provinces, if you run for the wrong party, you'll be fired. In some oh, provinces, oh, definitely, it has happened That's in a number surely of provinces. A, a, a grievance that you can win hands no, down. No, it isn't, because the political rights of provincial employees in most provinces are not a negotiable item. They're normally contained in a civil service act, a civil service act enacted by the cabinet, mm -hmm. normally by regulation, not even by the legislature, by the cabinet. Do you want that freedom all across the country? Certainly I want that freedom across the country. I think the provincial employee should have the same rights when it comes to politics as any other citizen in the country. Don't you agree? Uh, providing there's no conflict of interest. Fine. I'll go along with that. I mean, I hate to see teachers or teachers' wives in the same district on school boards. Fair enough. I can, I can accept that, too. Mm -hmm. There should be some minor restrictions. I can't think offhand of a, a conflict of interest. I would agree with you on that. Did you answer my question about disparities in wages and working conditions? Well, disparities in wages and working conditions, again, <coughs> uh, we come out to B.C. and we look at the contracts negotiated by the B.C.G.E.U. and we find them on balance. Uh, the best, I suppose. Oh, by far the best. Well, not, not in every respect by far. Uh, Ontario. Better than Ontario. Right. Yes. PEI, of course, is well, still well, on three course. bucks an hour. Well, Prince Edward Island, again, it's a different kind of economy yeah. there, and wages generally lag behind the rest Newfoundland. of the country. Newfoundland. Uh, the Newfoundland Union has done some good work in the last few years, but there are a lot of disparities there. Of course, the whole population of Newfoundland is used to disparities, and I guess now they've found the oil they're going to make up for it. Still 16, 20 percent unemployment? Yes. In fact, uh, my president of my union there says the true figure is closer to 30 percent. Hate to ask the next question, it annoys so many people. Index pensions all across the country? Yes, I'm in favor of index pensions for every citizen of the country, not just for union members, for every citizen of the country. It's easy for you to say that because you know perfectly well that your people can get their pension paid in the foreseeable future by slapping another tax on the back of the taxpayers. Well again, Jack, you're not quite right. In some provinces that may be true, but now let me tell you about the province where I come from, the province of Manitoba. The province of Manitoba pension fund for the, pub, for, for the provincial employee is entirely financed by the provincial employees themselves. It comes off of their wages. It isn't until they retire that the employer begins to put in a portion. So that fund, the civil service superannuation fund in Manitoba, is entirely funded by the employees, not by the employer. And if inflation is at 11 or 12 percent in the years ahead, do you think enough money will come in to meet index pensions 10, 15 years down the road? That that's, doubles in that's five a, years. That's a question that all governments across the country should be looking at and should have been looking at years ago. That's why, I can't, been looking at it why I can't accept the fact federally or provincially that provincial contributions, management and labor can finance index pension. It depends on the rate of inflation. Yes, in large part it does, Jack, and this is, a, this is something that all governments should be addressing themselves to, but they're not. Oh, this God. is not something that I, as a union president, or you as a, the, the capable interviewer you are, can solve. No. But you should get some of these premiers on here and see what they want to do about it. I know what the opposition will want to do. They'll take my view that it's all great. Somebody talk? has to pay for it. Have you ever it. talked to some of the premiers? Yes, I have. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Jack. Good morning. Good morning, Brother Jackson. Good morning. One thing I'd like to say to you is that it's good to hear Napchi's surface, uh, which the affiliated members in B.C. have not been uh, given a clear or um, a lot of information to um, us regarding your organization, which we do belong. We pay a per capita tax to Napchi yes. through the B.C.G.U. and through the B.C. Federation of Labor. Oh, I learned that one. Um, one thing I must say, you are a breath of fresh air. It is good to hear someone speak on behalf of the membership that they represent rather than projecting an image of political servitude. I strongly believe in your um, ideas on nonpartisanship within unions. Um, 
amalgamating yourself or uh, sticking to one party concepts such as what is happening now with the NDP. Is that you, old boy? Yes, it is. It's, it's Peacock a, from the what's it, Name again, name again, name again. Uh, Peacock. Oh, it's the old Wildcat expert who was cleared of wildcatting at the, the Horseshoe Bay Terminal. Right. <laughs> oh, what do you do these days? Sit and watch Webster? I'm back to work, Jack. How much are you making these days? Not much, let me tell you. Go on, tell me. We make just over 1100 bucks a month. Oh, come off it. That's come all. off it. I want the truth. That's it. With fringe benefits, you're telling me you're only making 1100 a month on the BC ferries and you've got a seniority of how many years? Seven years. Bobby, you got to tell me the truth one of these days. I'll bring you my paychecks, Jack. Okay, bring in the paycheck. And only I... then will I believe you. Pardon me? Bobby is a celebrated character in British Columbia who got greatly involved in a wildcat strike, but due to the bad handling by the union and the management, Bobby was charged and faced dreadful harassment and was cleared every which way. Congratulations, Bobby. Thank you for calling. Local character. Nice guy. Good showbiz. Go ahead from Victoria. Is that me? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's you. Yeah. Um, uh, I would like to ask you, guest Jack, uh, you know, I, I can't understand the, uh, the basic uh, makeup of Nupchi because you know, every province deals and negotiates on a provincial level. And if I didn't know better, I would suggest uh, to your guests that this looks like a lobby to the CLC. And, and uh, I would like his comments on, on that question. Uh, is this not a, a, a provincial employee's uh, CLC lobby issue? And is that not all that it is? Yes, caller, you've raised a very good point. In 1974, the Canadian Labour Congress, in their wisdom, uh, decided that all provincial public employee unions could join the Canadian Labour Congress only if they would form a national body and join through that national body. So in 1976, when the union was founded, its main purpose was and continues to be the vehicle that allows provincial employees into the Congress. It's interesting to note, however, that since that time, some of the component parts of the National Union, and mainly the larger component parts, have said that rather than let it simply be a vehicle to join the Congress, we're going to see that it has something useful to do. And those useful parts are, are beginning to evolve in the fields of union education, research, public relations, and so on. Uh -huh. However, I can tell you that the, the main task, the main task that I've had to undertake in my short time as president has been to simply keep the organization together in order to keep all of these parts in the Canadian Labour Congress. There was a dispute in 74 between CUPE and other people in the Congress. The compromise was reached, NUPCHI was formed, and you're right in suggesting that at one time that was the only reason it was formed. However, we've now passed the point of having only one reason for being in existence. Thank you. Victoria, again, they're all off four day week in Victoria. Go ahead, please. Morning, Jack. You don't mind my little job. Go ahead, Jack. Go ahead. I hope you and I can have a four day week someday, too. You and I should join a good union. Um, I'm interested in um, any differences or similarities there may be between NUPKI and uh, PSAC. Um, if I were to be a member of NUPGE, uh, would I have a vote as such a member, or would I? only be represented by the provincial government, BC Provincial Government Employees Association. Okay, now you would first have to be a member of the British Columbia Government Employees Union, and through your local structure that you have in the BCGEU, you can send resolutions on into the NUPCHI structure. You can even find a way to get yourself elected as a delegate to a NUPCHI convention. And when you get there, you'll be a part of the BCGEU delegation. So the only way you can join NUPCHI is by joining one of our provincial components. Yeah, there's no separate membership, in other words, in NUPCHI as such. So is, is it really an employee of uh, an organization of employees, or is it an organization of, uh, of provincial government employee unions? Well, as I said earlier, it, it is a federated structure. So yes, you've got to join one of the provincial employees unions, and then you become part of NUPCHI. Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, I'm interested in this for a number of reasons. The main reason is I'm a civil servant also, only I'm a federal civil servant. Yes. But uh, you, you people were talking about uh, uh, essential services. And I'm in an essential service position apparently because I'm a postal worker and a couple of months back they forced us back to work. And 
It's, uh, I'd like you people to know the position that you're going to be in. Strict political expediency, because we've provided essential service in the past. We've done work like uh, found blood samples for the Red Cross. We've sorted old age pension checks voluntarily, I might add, without pay. And a couple of two years later, because of political expediency, that it wasn't popular, the government forced us back to work. Um, it's just an observation. You people are going to be faced with the same sort of thing. And I think you have the right answer. The only real answer is there has to be agreement between the, the union and management as to what is a vital service. Because otherwise, you're going to have chaos. You're going to have union, union men, good, honest, working people, jailed, threatened with the loss of their jobs, threatened with fines, <coughs> because they're good union people. Good point. He made a good point, didn't he? He made a good point, and I would say about the postal workers, uh, they are people very much like the people I represent, performing an important service, but certainly every single one of them are not essential. And for that essentiality to unilaterally be, be dictated by a government is wrong, wrong, wrong. One more segment with um, Bill Jackson of Nupji after the break. Take a call from a hundred, hundred mile house, then I've got something to put you. Go ahead, please, to Bill Jackson. The Good morning, Jack. Morning. How are you down there today? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'll make this quick and then I'll just get off and listen to his answer. He made a statement about uh, if the law was made by, uh, I didn't quite catch the term he used, the law was made to be broken. That's a great attitude for our... Uh, this type of union thing. He I said, am tired of them. Now, uh, just a minute. What he said was that there may well be times when uh, an order of a court must be defied, and he quoted a case whereby um, a colleague of his was jailed and he felt unjustly on defying an order of a court. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, now carry on. Yeah, but still, if the court gave me a decision and I didn't abide by it, I'd expect to go to jail too, so I don't see what they're crying about. If they can't stand up to what the court tells them to do, then uh, they should either leave or do something else, you know. The unions are like that. They're just getting a little too overpowering. And uh, as a taxpayer, I'm getting a little bit fed up with the whole thing. I'll just hang up and let them answer it. Yeah, caller, I would say that you have an attitude that I cannot agree with, do not agree with, and will never agree with. Uh, while Jack and I were talking a while ago about the 1930s, I said I wasn't around, but I've read about those times. It would seem to me, had more people in Germany defied some of the laws passed in the 1930s, the world mightn't be in the mess that it's in today. Sometimes politicians make laws that people cannot support. And I'm not running around saying we should break the laws. In fact, I've never broken one knowingly. I've sped a few times, but that's about it. And I don't want to break any laws knowingly. But I'll tell you that when laws are made to take away the rights of a small portion of society, rather than applied equally across the total population, then to me, that is a bad law. It is a law that has to be changed. And there are a number of ways you can change it. You can do it through the democratic process, and that's the preferable way. Others, however, are impatient. And the gentleman I talked about in Ontario was impatient. He went to jail on an issue, by the way, that a board of arbitration agreed with him on a few days later. They won their whole case, but by that time he'd defied a court order. So he went to jail not for defying the issue that he was in dispute with the government of Ontario on, but because a court order had been issued and he defied that court order. Had he not defied the court order, they never would have won the case they'd been talking about in the first place. The Hitler analogy is a little bit of a cop-out. I would agree entirely if somebody passed a law saying there'd be gas chambers for a certain segment of the community, that must be defied. But by and large, in a democratic society, I don't find our courts that obnoxious on the subject of defiance of their orders. Yet. I, I'm being overdramatic, Jack, but I'm trying to make the okay, point. Okay, Thin edge of the wedge. Uh, that, good for you, old boy. Thanks for your call. That calls from Port Radium, isn't it? Port Radium in the territories, I think, isn't it? Go ahead, please. Was there? Are you there? See if you can pick them up again, Linda. Yes. See if, yes, you're there. Speak up, please. You're on the air from Port Radium. Yeah, I'm here. Hello, Jack. Yes, yes. Speak up. Yeah. Good morning, Jack. Morning. Good morning again and again and again. Go ahead to Bill Jackson. Yeah, I would, uh, first I would like to greet you from the Northwest Territories. Thank you. 
Good. It's so far away, it's taking a second and a half to get to you. question is to your uh, guest. He's only talking about the provinces in Canada. Well, sir, my mandate only extends to the provinces. I represent provincial employees. At now the moment, employees... In the Yukon. Yes, in the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. If you belong to a government union, you'll probably belong to the Public Service Alliance of Canada. I hope you become a province, and then I can say that I have members in the North. Now, listen in Port Radium. If you want to say something, just start and say it now. Go ahead. Okay, that says... <laughs> You give him a wee chat off there. I'm sorry, we have, we've got a... Uh, I would like to first of all tell you that uh, we are the only people in the far north to receive your program. I don't know if you ever heard about that. No, I'm delighted. The, 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 uh, Radium is a very small community. How good is the reception? The program, we would like to say thank you to you. Oh, that's great. Stay on for a long time. What programs have you liked best? It's quite clear, just as good. Just as good. You've been getting it now for what, two months? Two months? Your program with uh, Trudeau. Oh, you got it for, with old Pierre, baby. Well, thank you very much, and do call me again, and I hope the next time we get a slightly better connection. Thank you. Is he gone? I'll try once more. What's the temperature this morning? Thank you. What's the temperature this morning? Our uh, temperature is about 45 below. Oh! oh. I'm glad you're in Port Radium and I'm in Burnaby. But one of these days, I'll come up and see you. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye, Jack. <laughs> I think that what he was doing was, as a new watcher in Port Radium and the Territories, he wasn't turning down his volume or he was lip reading off the set, yes. which accounted for the delay between us. One little nag to finish you. Your image is all important, isn't it? I don't know whether it's all important, Jack. You don't care about your image. Oh, I care, but I don't know whether it's all important. The thing that's important to it's me... It's for public support. The thing that's important to me is the image of the public sector employee that I represent as being a good, conscientious citizen of the country, not somebody to be abused by bad laws. We story the other day. We had it on the news last night. Cupid are now organizing the mother crossing guards in Delta. They've been doing it on a relief, relief basis. But now that Cupid's in there, the crossing guards must be paid a minimum. And if one of them is sick, you can't phone up Mrs. Jones next door. You've got to get a replacement through the union. Seems a bit much going for crossing guards, isn't it? Well, You'll I... price crossing guards out of the market, as you always do. Oh, I don't think we price anybody out of the market, Jack. What happens is we bring up the wages of people who are not paid properly in the first place, and I think that's a good policy. Including crossing guards. And if I didn't believe in that, of course, I wouldn't believe in trade unions. But you can, you can carry it to extremes, hypothetically speaking. Hypothetically, I'll agree, but only hypothetically. We've got to have unionized crossing guards. I'm going to speak to the BCGEU and see why they didn't organize the crossing guards so they'd be my members, and then I could speak more intelligently on it. Because we've got to, I mean, and we've got to pick at the crossing guards of the non-unions. Stop the children crossing the road to go to school. No, we have to get the children safely to school, and you and I both agree with that, and I'm sure all of my members do too. And really, well, you're talking about an issue that I'm not totally familiar with, but I'm going to become familiar yeah, with it when I'm out Please do, because it could blow up into a big thing. Mm -hmm. It's like unionization ruined a thousand daycare centers in B.C., is that right? Well, At I'll have to look into that. It's been readjusted. But your old friends in Sorwalk got in mm. and wrote contracts which were unbelievable. So they lost the contract in that particular case I'm talking about. Well, uh, Bill Jackson, you're now only flexing your muscles. We'll see how long you stay in your job and what strength you achieve in your militant direction of Nupji. Thank you, Jack. A pleasure to be in BC and to be on your program. My thanks to Bill Jackson. Next day, uh, Valerie Haig Brown, Roderick's widow. A well known and highly respected character in the life of British Columbia all through my time here was Roderick Haig Brown. He was a cougar hunter at one time, I learned from this book. He was a magistrate, he was an outdoorsman, he was an ecologist, he was an author, and a raconteur. And first of all, I want to 
apologize for my wrong introduction of you, Valerie Higbrown. Correct me, please. I'm his eldest daughter. <laughs> uh, not his widow. I do apologize. Sorry. Just a slip of the tongue. How many kids did Roderick have? Four. <coughs> four. Excuse me, four of us, yeah. Four kids. Now, this book here, Woods and River Tales, who wrote them? He wrote the tales. He Never published before? Uh, three or four of them have been published before. Um, one in the New Yorker, two in Weekend Magazine, and some of the very early ones in delightful English magazines called things like Illustrated, Sporting, and Dramatic. You are therefore yeah, the editor. I am the editor. When did Roderick die? He died in 1976. Uh, well, uh, tell me about his cougar hunting days. I never remember them. I always dealt with them on news stories uh, or political yeah, things yeah. or semi-political things yeah. of some yeah. kind. Conservation, basically. Conservation, yeah. yes. Tell me uh, about his days as a cougar hunter the way back. Well, when he first came out from England at the age of 17, he worked in the woods in Washington State, as a matter of fact, because they were friends of the family. Um, and after six months, he couldn't stay there any longer, so uh, he had to come into Canada, and he fell in love with Vancouver Island, the Nimkish River particularly, mm -hmm. and lived there and did all of the things that young men do, uh, logging, fishing, hunting, trap line one winter, uh, and obviously cougar hunting was very much a part of it. Um, he would have hunted the cougars more um, for the pelts when he was trapping, for the bounty, um, not as a specific thing that he did all by itself, but uh, that piece by Al Purdy, which introduces the book, is called Cougar Hunter because uh, Purdy um, picked on the you know, kind of person that hunted cougars and saw that in him, and uh, that's why Daddy was very delighted with that particular piece, because he enjoyed the fact that people remembered he did all that stuff too. Did he remain a hunter? He did not remain a hunter um, by, mm, I'd say by after the war. He went hunting uh, with friends occasionally for grouse, but not terribly concerned about shooting Yeah, cats. not the kind of guy I would imagine who could draw a bead on a, on a deer. No, he didn't. I mean, he could. He, he certainly did when it was necessary for food. He was one of the last of the lay magistrates from British Columbia. Was, when was yeah. he appointed a magistrate? He was appointed in 1942 and served until uh, not long before he died, about a year before he died, when the province decreed that there would be no more lay magistrates. Well, he, of course, was the exception that proved the rule as a lay magistrate. We had many disastrous lay magistrates, yeah. and we had many disastrous magistrates, too. But he but still believed and stated it very firmly that uh, there should be lay magistrates. We would have to choose them carefully. Mm -hmm. He felt very strongly about that and remained determined that there should be such a thing as lay magistrates because it keeps the law from getting too far from the people. Do I recall... Uh, Roderick Hague Brown being involved in the great Battle Lake battle. Remember Super the battle to preserve oh, Battle I? Lake from the yeah. dams? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't even tell you now if that battle was won or was it lost. Uh, I guess you have to say it was lost. The dam was not built on Battle Lake, it was built on Upper Campbell Lake, the next lake down the chain, because there was no solid footing for a dam in the Battle Valley, because there's gravel at the mouth of the, of the lake. Um, but the dam on the lower lake was built high enough to raise the level of the water in Bottle as well, which is in a provincial park, and which meant that a great deal of uh, virgin timber was cut. And frankly, I don't want to go to Bottle Lake anymore. They logged the edges, didn't they? Yes, they did. They didn't log it completely, as I no, recall. No, but they logged the edges, but that meant there was a lot of very, very fine one of my own little, timber. One of my own little memories uh, of the Bottle Lake controversy many, many years ago Jeez, I sound like I'm 95. I'm not. I remember it, and I'm not 95. Oh, but you don't know this one. When I was a reporter covering the legislature, the Battle Lake protagonists, big fat man from the States, I can't remember his name, um, yeah, and um, they, had a, they had a suite for the somewhat easily influenced reporters of the day, or just as easily influenced today. Uh, reporters aren't easily influenced. Oh, don't you kid mm. yourself. <laughs> and this was the most magnificent suite with the most magnificent booze and the most magnificent food. And I think it ran about 20 hours, uh, 24 hours a day in the Empress Hotel. That's they were deadly fun. serious about their lobbying. To Bill Reed was extremely serious about it because he felt that the park should be saved. He was an old man. Uh, he himself. was he on? He was, he was the big, fat American you're talking about. He wasn't that big. No, but I'm talking about the guys on the other side who wanted to damn it. Oh, the guys who wanted to damn it. It no. wasn't Bill Reed. No, 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 not Bill Reed. No. Um, the guys who wanted to damn it. Can't remember now. It doesn't matter. It would have been uh, probably but I Kaiser. Remember, I had just come, you know, from Britain a mm -hmm. couple of years before, and I wasn't used to this extravagant uh, courting of common and garden reporters. <laughs> which well. 
it's still done, but not to that extent. I really think reporters have reached a point where they're not as easily swayed. As yeah, but they're not as interested as they used to be either. They don't have the sense of injustice because they all have it too soft nowadays. That's possible. That's don't possible. You agree? I mean, look how soft you had it. Brought uh, up with a famous father, affluent, comfortable life. Um, <laughs> we had a lovely life, but it wasn't soft. It no. wasn't particularly soft. Oh, I know it wasn't. People say, you know, I had what was an idyllic childhood, but... Do you a hunter? No. Listen to this for all his grandchildren. Anne, Charlotte, Nora, Celia, Desmond, Elizabeth, Benjamin, William, James, and Sophie. And Sophie. And those yet to come. How many more are we on don't the know. way? <laughs> 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 Nothing specific. My brother Alan says, put that in, and just in case. <laughs> just in case there are any more. Somebody else said, oh, well, it could be the great-grandchildren. It's a good book. Short stories. I've yeah. skipped read it. So I wish you well with it, Valerie Haig Brown. I Thank haven't, you. I didn't see your father for, what, ten years? It must be ten years or more ago. I bumped into him in Victoria. It's called Woods and River Tales. How much is it? Twelve ninety-five. Twelve ninety-five. That's the standard cost of books these days. And paper. <laughs> Best of luck to you. Thank you, Valerie Haig Brown. Is uh, Mrs. Haig Brown still alive? Oh yes, very much so. I'm going do up there on Friday. Do I give her my regards. I hope she was watching this morning. I think so. Anyone want to say to mother? <laughs> Hi, ma. <laughs> yeah, right. Hi, ma. <laughs> Webster with a free for all after the break. that clipping. I'm hoping for a call from Rape Relief in Vancouver on this segment of the program after what I said about them at the opening part of the program this morning. Um, they have, according to Canadian press, and they won't talk for themselves, they won't put anybody on the program. When I phoned them first about this particular report, they said they hadn't yet read it, but they operate by consensus and they can't speak to the media until they've had the little committee meeting. I'm interested in the fact that they get $61,000 in public funds. Uh, Attorney General's Department, Human Resources, Health, and of course, Vancouver City Council. And the report is that they are using this rape confrontation tactic in British Columbia. And that on how many times was it? Oh, three or four confrontations in Vancouver where 15 members or so of this rape relief organization appear at the door of a man whom they claim to know has committed rape, but who was not charged or convicted. And when the man answers the door, they chant, we know what you did, we know who you are, we're watching you, acting as judge, jury, and executioner. A highly unfair tactic, to say the least. You just can't do that kind of thing in our society. I presently am investigating another case, and I tell you this just to make the point brutally clear, that because a man has been charged and convicted doesn't necessarily mean he is guilty, or a woman. That because the police have not charged or have not taken steps to lead to conviction of doesn't mean that the guy should have been charged or convicted. And the case I'm investigating right now with considerable gravity and seriousness involves a man who is doing a life sentence for murder. And I am assured that this is not a good conviction, even though he has been as high as the Supreme Court of Canada where his appeal was denied. And you'll be hearing more about that on other programs. And I raise that subject merely to say that it's exceedingly dicey for vigilante groups of any kind, be they the Ku Klux Klan or be they rape relief, to take the law into their own hands and it is a piece of hysterical nonsense up with which we must not put. Fair enough? I don't know if you want to talk about Jackson. Nupchi. What else have I not covered? these days. I haven't done enough in the way of free-for-alls anyway. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, Jack. Morning. There's something that I would like to hear about, and that is, for a long time, both parties have mentioned uh, homemakers being able to contribute to Canada Pension Plan. 
No, I happen to be a widow who was left without, can't, not old enough. If home, you, are you talking about homemakers implied by the homemaker savage, or do you mean women? No, Canadian homemakers being able to. What do you mean homemakers? You mean Canadian wives? If you like. Housewives, if you like, being... Okay, the Liberal government is partially committed to changing it. The Tories were partially committed to change it. None of them has... The Liberals certainly haven't made a decision on it. Uh, will they ever? Well, it's like index pensions. How much can you afford? Well, if we're paying into it, we're working, you know. We're working? working. You mean you're working for your husband? Uh, no, we're working to look after our home. Oh, fair enough. That's a financial question. It's like putting up the old age pensions, a hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. That's all it is, ma'am. It's up to the government to listen. Webster. Good morning, Jack. Morning. My Go name ahead. is Bruce York. I think you know me. Know you? <laughs> Can't get away from you. <laughs> well, that's all right. Bruce York, describe yourself this morning, Mr. York, for the purpose of this appearance on the program by telephone. Well, Jack, I'm phoning to ask you to give some publicity to a meeting that I've called for um, this Wednesday at 8 o'clock at the Plaza 500 Ballroom. Who are you to call a meeting? Pardon? Who are you to call a meeting? Well, I'm one of the, um, I guess, 200,000 people in Vancouver facing a mortgage uh, renewal uh, are you uh, situation. Are you, going personally in my case from are you personally facing one? Pardon? Are you personally facing one? Personally facing one, Jack. What is the renewal for how much and what interest rates? Well, I'm, my present one is at 12%, and what it's going to be at, uh, that's the whole problem. I don't know what it's going to be at. It could be 16, 17, whatever the situation is. And, when does uh, your mortgage... That could mean a very large increase in um, you when know, does your, uh, interest. When does your mortgage expire? When does mine expire? In November, Jack. Is this on a business? Five-year one. No, on this... a home. Oh, it's not an office block you own or something. No, it's not an office block that I own. <laughs> and who are you, Bruce? You know the facts better than that, Jack. Who are you? You haven't told people who you bleeding well are. Oh, well, in, in this particular case, I'm, uh, I'm a homeowner. And, uh, you never and, did uh, anything. I'm facing this mortgage uh, situation as far as my home is concerned. Bruce, you never did anything as a homeowner in your life. You're on a political ply. Spell out the political ply. Oh, well, uh... What I want to try and do is to organize people who are in like circumstances, no matter what their politics are, Jack, because we all have a common interest in that. And for You're that reason, sounding like Bruce Erickson this morning. Hey, pardon? You're sounding like Bruce Erickson. Well, I'm trying to be... Uh, is uh, this on behalf of your political party? At time. All I want to do is to ask people who have the same circumstance, namely that they're facing mortgage renewal rates in this year, to come to a public meeting at 8 o'clock on Wednesday at the... Bruce, 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 you must be forthright. Who is organizing? Which political party do you belong to? Nobody. Nobody is organizing it. This is... Okay, Bruce York is having a meeting for anyone who wants to join him at the Plaza 500 at 8 o'clock. What night? Wednesday. Thank you. About mortgage rates. He's giving me double talk, and I don't like double talk. After the break. I'm very sorry I had such a kind of off-and-on connection to Port Radium this morning. Certainly nice to hear from you. Glad you're enjoying the program. And I'd like an occasion, too, when possible, to hear from other areas in the north uh, whom we are now reaching by Anik B satellite. It's a nice feeling to know that I'm sitting here in the warmth and you're up there in 45 below. Courtney, go ahead, please. Hello, I'd just like to speak on uh, your earlier thing on uh, women's groups. Yes. Um, I feel that I have to agree with you on quite a few uh, points of your argument. Uh, it seems sexist to be throwing away money to uh, groups just based on their, well, sex, uh, as well as... Uh, it seems like almost fascist politics to uh, surround somebody's house like that and, I don't know, chant and scream when there's no real proof. That's right. It's the Ku Klux Klan. That's what it is. Well, it sure sounds like it to me. And I well, I mean, I'm desperately anxious to have them on the air to tell me, to deny it, to give me their version. Canadian press ran the story. I've spoken to the people from Rate Leaf. Uh, we've had four telephone conversations with them, and we got the formal decision from their consensus but they would not send anybody to appear on the program, and because they would not send anybody, it doesn't mean I'm going to drop the subject. 
This morning I checked out very rapidly how much public money they get, 61,000 in a year, most of it from the provincial government. And I want to point out in as blunt a fashion as I can that this kind of vigilante tactic cannot be tolerated in civilized society. Well, if, on the other hand, they want to go to all the other acquittals in the courts, people who are acquitted of fraud, people who are acquitted of murder, people of this and that, and say, we know you did it, we know you did it, we know you did it, you can imagine what kind of shambles would take place in this country in the administration of justice. And eventually it would not be tolerated I am sure, in fact, that it constitutes an offence under the Canadian Criminal Code of harassment, watching, besetting and harassing. I'm almost sure there's still a segment, a section in the Criminal Code which covers that aspect of vigilante action. Well, I must say, I think we're giving them at least $60,000 too much. I could not. I certainly concur with your remarks. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Cranbrook, British Columbia. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. I have a couple things I'd like to talk to you about. But first of all, that caller from Port Radium, I think he was talking from a two-way radio from his end. And while he is talking, he can't hear you. Yes. So now, in future, therefore, let me say to Port Radium and anyone calling me on a radio phone, let's do it over, 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 and then over and out. Right. Uh, Jack, I just got through reading Go Boy, you know, by Roger Caron. Yeah, the guy I had on the air here. Right, and I enjoyed that interview very much. Uh, in the book, it suggests that there's a, a second one coming up. Uh, has it been published or what? No, will? it's not been published. I asked them about that on the interview or in the studio. But when it comes up, if I get a copy, I'll let you know. Right. Now, the second question. Uh, capital punishment seems to be in the news. And uh, I have a side on it. I won't tell you what it is, but, and I'm sure most everybody in Canada has. I think the main question should be dealt with now is a public referendum on it, because if you remember the uh, vote that took place, free vote, supposedly, and uh, do you remember at the time that the cabinet voted unanimously with Trudeau when in the uh, previous three months they were having public squabbles about whether they were going to have donuts or, uh, or whatever for their, with their coffee? And I feel that this is one question that the people of Canada should be given a vote to decide themselves. I don't. I don't, for the following reasons. Um, uh, you elect people to govern. You cannot run a country by referenda. Referenda. You can't do it. On a question like separation of the province of Quebec from the rest of Canada, or separation of Canada from Quebec, whatever you like, I think that's a thing where the very existence of the state is uh, threatened that a referendum ballot is, is entitled to be held. But you, we elect people under our parliamentary system to go to Ottawa and pass legislation. And if we don't like them on a big enough issue, it's our duty to throw them out. And then you elect people whom you wish to follow your wishes. That's all. You can't do about referendum. You'd have referendums every five minutes. And how many people vote? And how many people know an issue when they vote? Well, Jack, uh Oh, you remember it was a free vote. Oh, no, no. I remember all the free votes. Conscience, no. not mine. I mean, there are certain murders right now for which I would advocate the death penalty. So would I. I, I find the... Uh... And I don't like it, and I want the proof to be total a thousand percent solid. All this right. case I'm talking about just now, had we had capital punishment, this young man would have gone to the gallows in Ocala jail, and, you know, more and more each day I'm beginning to think that he had nothing to do with the killing. Well, then you're certainly suggesting that there wasn't clear-cut evidence. I'll have a program about it next week. Well, um, I hope so, because I think that there's a lot of people that uh, may not even want to be identified as to which way they stand, but they feel strongly that they should have a, a part in the uh, decision. On I agree with you, but our way of doing it, unless we change the whole parliamentary system, is by electing the people who will do the things you want. But thanks for your call, anywho. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Um, have you ever thought of looking into these uh, no commission real estate outfits? I'm not aware of any no commission. I'm aware of some three and a half. Oh, you're talking about the people who sell you a service. Eh? Hey? Well, people who sell you a kit. No, they, uh, they're these uh, outfits, uh, I think they've, they've just come up fairly recently. That operate no, they advertise no commission and they. Can't be done. And no, there must be a. In their operation. There must be a fee somewhere for somebody or you can't do it. What they do is uh, they take up options on 
Uh oh. Homes, and then. Uh, okay, let me warn people about options. Yep. I was talking to a big. I had of a case was within my own kind of group, recently where somebody went to my friend and said, "I'll give you an option. I'll take an option on your house for one year at a certain price." Yeah. Now, that is a highly dangerous thing to do, except in the following circumstances. If somebody offers you an option on your valuable property, you must first of all balloon the price a year ahead for the expected inflation. And we'll say that you balloon it ahead to $150,000, which is not unusual nowadays for remarkably ordinary properties. And then you say, certainly, sir, we'll say it's valued for the moment at $112,000. And this uh, slippery Sam comes to give you an option at $112,000. You say, sir, I will give you an option on my house at $150,000. And that option must be signed once you have given me a certified check for $15,000 now which is not returnable if the option is not exercised. Options, and I got this from a very big businessman the other day with him, you know, a big money guy, never give an option to anyone for anything less than 10% of the ballooned price at the end of the option period. Now, you'll find in those cases, nobody will come and ask you for an option. That's how to beat them. But I, I advise ordinary people, do not give an option on your house to anyone who wants a 30 or 60 day or a 90 day option. He will give you a fixed price, say 100,000 or 90,000. He'll flog it for 130. And the difference between your option price and the price he gets is in his pocket. Yeah. Don't touch it with a barge pole and thanks for the warning. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Morning. I'd like to address an issue uh, regarding Domestics, uh, an earlier call. Domestics? That, domestic help. Uh -huh. That uh, come into the country as immigrants. Oh, you don't mean wives? No, I don't mean wives. Mind you, at times that they deserve a break as well. But uh, I, I feel that uh, many times poor, unfortunate people have been taken advantage of, and they are being taken advantage of consistently across the country. Many people that are strictly as an immigrant group or may come to Canada to work for a number of years and go back to their own country. That's correct. And many of them, some of them are illegals and some uh, of them come here for a period and then they want to stay and it causes all kinds of complications. That's right. But even in the, in the wealthier families that do hire this, this help, you find situations where a person uh, may have come to Canada to work for, uh, for a certain family who uh, is then pointed out by, uh, I'd like to bring out a case of, uh, who was that the Irish uh, movie producer who was shipped out of the country for being possibly an IRA? He wasn't no movie producer. You're talking about my old friend McCann. Well, I said possible movie producer. McCann was the guy who finished up in the bucket in Dublin. Okay, well, that, that's the man. He had, he had a, a lady working for him uh, who was from Holland, who, uh, She's out a lot. Of the you don't have to tell me the sad story. She's out a lot because she's in Dublin. Last I had, he was facing a serious charge. Right, but she was she was from Holland originally, and she came to Canada to work for this family. Is she an immigrant or a visitor? She wasn't an immigrant. She was just a housekeeper for them. So what's the point? As a student person. She's been done. All right, but she went back to Holland and found that she cannot immigrate to Canada by reason of her association with her family. Well, who am I to make a judgment? I don't know. Well, th that's that's a, a small type of problem. Uh, Tell if you don't want to look at the at the case of being underpaid, of uh, working for room and board and a possible pittance. I mean, we're looking at medieval times. They used to call them au pair girls that's in right. the old days. That's no, sympathy, but not. Don't want to discuss it in detail, particularly. Take a break. Good morning. Good morning, Jack. Can I still ask you a few about the following points about unions? Yeah. Um, I do feel that they're not a de democratic organization anymore. Not everybody is ready, willing, and able to join and work and will join the union are allowed to do so. 
you have become protectionist for a special interest group, and certainly not for all workers. Just like the Canadian Manufacturers Association. Correct. You can't make a blank statement like that, man. Some unions are democratic, some are not democratic, and if they're not democratic, it's the fault of the membership who won't go to the meetings. The old hardline, hardliners, they I stay till the end of the meeting. Some of us refused entrance that on the longshoremen's, the, the, some of these people cannot join the union because they are protectionists. The longshore union? Long you're, talk, union? You're, you're talking about the casuals on the waterfront. Well, you call them casuals. I know uh, they're ready, willing, and able workers who are not allowed to join the union. That's right. That's protectionist by the longshore union. No argument about it. They protect them. They're their own group. So no, they have become a special interest group to protect Agreed. their own workers. If you're specific about the longshoremen, I'll say yes, you're correct. Well, then all I can say is that how do they pretend to be democratic? And I is it not all the people, or all sort of workers who cannot join the union, who suffer when they go on strike? I'll give you another example of the craft unions who can, through the apprenticeship boards, control the number of apprentices who go in. That, in a way, is for their protection, but it's also protectionist. Yes. And uh, that's Would you say that perhaps our direction should be now in profit sharing and Too late. government Too management late. and workers should get together rather than the union situation we have, which has caused nothing but strikes, loss of wages to workers, and no, really no any any goals are being reached. You may well be right. Saves a long argument. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd like to make two points on the rape relief organization. Yes, please. Uh, number one, uh, sure, I'm sure you agree that there is some need for increased public awareness. Of yes. The rape problem. Yes. Okay, uh, I just wanted to make sure that you agree. Oh, no. Uh, they, they may well have done some good work. Why spoil it all with this garbage? Yeah, okay, that goes without saying. Uh, number two is, I'm a cab driver in New Westminster, and I was at the cave last weekend, and very prominently displayed on the coat check desk is a flyer put out by Rape Relief singling out cab drivers as potential rapists. And I was somewhat insulted by the inferences. Um, I wonder if you, did you pick up a copy of it? Oh yeah, I got it right here in front of me. Oh, you put it in the mail to me, or drop it in, I'll pay the fare. Okay, no problem. If you drop it in, I'll pay the fare. Okay, great. Because you're only coming from Westminster to Burnaby Enemy. Yeah, anyway. that's, I know right where it's at. Go by every day. No tip, I'll pay the fare. Okay. Let's have it. Okay. This morning. Okay. And I'll use it on the air tomorrow. This afternoon. Okay. Okay. As soon as you can. Okay. Right. Bye. 7650 Enterprise Lake City Industrial Place. Oh, yeah, yeah. 7850. 7850. Good call. Very useful. <laughs> Cheap, too. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to talk to you about the apprenticeship program. My husband is an auto body apprentice, and the government has screwed him around so badly now that he's finished his second year that he's going to have to quit. He just finished um, his second year course up in o Okanagan College in Kelowna. Right. And uh, I don't know how they think they can get away with it, you know. Well, let me get this clear. He's finished his second year's training in Okanagan College as an auto mechanic. Auto body. Auto body. Yeah. What should be the next step? Well, you see, and then he's supposed to go back to work, like he's indentured to a company, right? Right. And why is he not going back to work? There's no work. He had to quit that job before he went to school. So now he's, he's indentured to a company which can't employ him. That's right. So he becomes an unskilled laborer again, or a non-union guy. Yeah, well, there's no, he wasn't in the union in the first place. When does the company say they can take him back? Well, they don't. How old are you? How old is he? He's 25 and I'm 20. Any children? Um, in about a month, I'm expecting one. I, yeah, I could tell that. Yeah. And uh, you, he should be going back to the indentured company and have some kind of steady employment. Yeah, but there isn't any, and he had to quit before he went to school. Is he well enough trained now to out, go out and get a job as an auto mechanic? No. Auto body it is. Auto body. Well, he's a very good worker. He's a hard worker, you know, and he's got his own tools, and that's a lot more than the how journeyman many, has. How many more years does he have to do of his indenture before he's a journeyman? Two years. But, you know, they really rip the guys off. I don't know how a lot of them get through. They get $33 a week up there going to school, and plus we've got to, you know, keep our place down here. Have you been living down here? Yeah. Are well, you? no, I went with him. Were you working? No. 
Well, how could you live on $33 a week? Well, we're both collecting unemployment now. Were well, you collecting it then? Mm hmm. Hmm? Started getting it now. But, um... So you'll be, be collecting how much now? 200 and some a week? No, I get 180 every two weeks, and he gets 300 every two weeks. So that just pays our rent. We pay 360 a month for rent. So that gives you an income of 960 a month, more or less. Yeah. But, you know, the thing is, I don't know. The government is so screwed up that way. Well, you can hardly blame the government for the indentured firm not taking him back on the job, can you? No, but I don't see how they expect people to have to move way up to Kelowna, find themselves a place. Well, I mean, it was his choice. I don't want to be tough on you, but with 960 a week, 960 a month at the moment, you can at least survive. Best of luck. Gotta go. After the break. Yes, ma'am. Tomorrow morning, we have Don McDonald, who is the editor of City Woman magazine. Very outspoken. Also, new energy minister, Mark Lalonde. The Mark Lalonde? Remember Trudeau sat here and said, and I said to Trudeau, elect the Liberals and get cheap gas. Remember that? We should maybe look at that clip mm, for the morning. Be good. In case uh, Mark tells us that there was no such promise or indication whatsoever from his dearly beloved leader. Tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely.